Hey everybody, Mike here. We now have the first official Starlink speed test results directly from SpaceX, and it's looking pretty awesome. During the launch webcast last week, we also got some official updates on the Starlink private beta and our first details on the Starlink space lasers. All these details coming up. During the last Starlink launch webcast, the host, Kate Tice, confirmed that employee trials are well underway and that users of the system have been getting download speeds greater than 100 megabits per second, which she described as plenty of speed to download multiple HD videos with bandwidth to spare. I know from all the comments you've been leaving on previous videos that many of you are excited about these speeds, particularly those of you on existing satellite technology like Viasat, HughesNet, ExploreNet, um, or really kind of at the edge of, of landline internet, that these speeds are pretty incredible. Some others have been commenting kind of the opposite direction, that you were anticipating these one gigabit per second speeds and that 100 megabits is kind of a letdown compared to what you were expecting. Now, we, the general public, don't really have a lot of data to go on here. 100 megabits per second, again, these are the first updates that are official from SpaceX, seems pretty good to me, but really it's so early that it's hard to tell. As SpaceX adds more satellites and more ground stations, we might expect the speed to get even better. But also, as we transition from private beta to public beta, we're gonna have a lot more users on the system and it's reasonable to expect that the speeds are going to slow down. Thankfully, that same webcast confirmed that the public beta is planning to launch later this year. And once we get these users on the system, we should have much more real world data on what the system performance is going to be like. My hope is that during the public beta, it's just going to be too many people to enforce any kind of an NDA and with my hope is they're going to open it up so that people can actually talk about what they're seeing and, and share kind of the speeds and bandwidths that they're experiencing. I've also had a lot of comments from people looking at other deployment styles for Starlink, in particular RVs and other motorized vehicles, and even as far as camping and overlanding. So it was interesting that later on in the webcast, SpaceX confirmed that they are looking at applications for boats and also airplane usage of Starlink. So hopefully that then extends that our residential user terminals potentially can be used in those mobile applications. Whether that's actually service while a vehicle is moving, or even I know some of you have commented that just being able to park and then set up the dish to get service in a different location kind of each night uh, would be a great benefit as well. So hopefully we see some progress there. In addition to the launch webcast, we also have some additional details. Just a day before, SpaceX presented to the FCC regarding their modification application for the Starlink constellation. If you remember, they're applying to reduce the satellite orbits down to that same 540, 570 kilometer range as the initial shell that they're deploying now. And effectively, they're asking the FCC to hurry up and make a decision because they're starting to deploy these. And in the presentation, SpaceX goes over some more details on the status of the constellation, including some more official speed test results, which include latency numbers. So we can use this presentation, which they made public a day after the webcast, to get a bit more insight into the state of the constellation. So let's take a look at those slides now. This slide just shows some basics of the Starlink constellation. If you're subscribed to my channel and you've been watching my videos, there's nothing new here. This is pretty old news. But this slide has a little bit more detail I wanted to look into. So if you go down the bullets, third from the bottom, they have building gateway ground stations throughout the United States and internationally. This is the first confirmation I've seen that they've actually started building ground stations outside of the United States. Being a Canadian, my hope is that some of those are here, but I imagine that they're probably also looking in Europe and around the world. 
We've seen data that suggests it, but the bottom bullet here, this is the first data I've seen directly from SpaceX that confirms that the private beta is actually happening in multiple US states. All the information we had before suggested that really it was restricted to Washington state. So that's pretty interesting. This slide is probably the most interesting. If you haven't seen my speed test video, we go through some early results that were basically scraped from speedtest.net. On this slide, we've got actually two official speed test results, and you can see the latency is actually lower than any of the ones we looked at previously. And the download speed is actually much higher than any of those initial tests. So this is really exciting. You can see 19 milliseconds, 18 milliseconds, and both have 100 megabits per second or better download bandwidth and 40 megabits per second upload. Another part I found interesting, the third bullet from the bottom, you can see it says Ethernet and integrated Wi-Fi capacity in user terminal. Up till now, everything looked like the user terminal might be just Ethernet, and then there was a separate device that provided Wi-Fi within your home. But this seems to suggest that maybe there is also Wi-Fi capacity in the user terminal itself. So for a very small installation where your computer is not far from the user terminal, potentially you could be getting Wi-Fi directly from there without the need for the extra piece of hardware. The next few slides are just summaries of the actual modification application, what they want to do, moving those satellites to a lower orbit, and then a breakdown of, of what orbital shells. The last two columns here are the most interesting to me. These are the inclinations, the two shells that are designed to cover the polar regions of the world, which would actually allow them to provide coverage everywhere on Earth. This slide is mostly information we know, but I thought it was interesting in the Earth station elevation. We knew about the 25 degrees, that was in the other FCC applications for the user terminals, but the 5 degrees for gateways in the polar region, it looks like they're anticipating having a ground station in the polar region that can relay from the more dense constellation around 53 degrees, relay into those satellites covering the polar regions. So that also suggests that they're not anticipating that the laser links will be ready for prime time uh, in time to serve the polar regions. So I thought that was maybe a potential clue on their, their confidence or at least planning around the intersatellite links. If they had the laser links between the satellites, they probably wouldn't really need a gateway at all in the polar regions. My last video was an update on the FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. And if you remember from that last video, and check it out if you haven't seen it, the FCC is basically skeptical of Starlink's latency claims. And as of now, they're reluctant, almost refusing, to evaluate Starlink in the low latency category, the less than 100 milliseconds. So it's Interesting that this presentation goes into the details of the latency, but it is really directed at their application to modify the constellation. It's not in relation to the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund application. And if you remember from the previous video, SpaceX only has until September 23rd to amend their application to, in a sense, prove their claim of, of their latency numbers. So it will be interesting to see if this presentation bleeds over into that uh, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund application to help make Starlink's case that they should qualify for that low latency. If you're getting value from these updates, hit the like button down below. It really helps the channel grow. And while you're down there, leave a comment. Let me know what you think of these latest speed test updates. The most interesting part of all of these updates is SpaceX has confirmed during their launch webcast that they've now completed initial testing of their inter-satellite laser links, or as they call, space lasers. A laser. These space lasers are important for two primary cases. The first is it will allow Starlink to serve internet to remote locations where it's not possible to install a ground station. Think over the middle of the ocean, uh, in very remote polar regions, or really anywhere 
where putting a ground station, whether that's physical restrictions or kind of geopolitical restrictions, anywhere where it makes installing a ground station difficult. Without the ground station, with these inter-satellite laser links, Starlink will be able to use the direct signal from the user terminal up to the Starlink, then between satellites until it can reach a ground station to access the rest of the internet. It also opens up some interesting use cases of point-to-point -point communication, where two user terminals want to talk to each other, and really there's no need for that traffic to go through a ground station at all. It can just go from user terminal through the satellite network and these laser links, and then right back down to another user terminal. The second reason these inter-satellite links are interesting is latency. Over short distances, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. But when you're talking longer distances, think, say, New York to London or New York to Japan, where it actually has a latency advantage because these laser links are traveling through space, they actually move faster than a similar laser traveling through optical fiber. So the satellite links, even though they have to go up into orbit, then around the Earth, so a longer physical distance, they can actually go faster than the same signal traveling through an optical fiber going around the surface of the Earth. Now we're not talking massive time savings. This is in the milliseconds. But when you're talking about financial data, think high frequency trading, being able to get data from say New York to the London Stock Exchange even a little bit earlier has massive, massive financial benefits for any company who can take advantage of those extra milliseconds. So this is particularly exciting for those types of use cases. We don't know a lot from the webcast update. The only numbers they gave us is that these tests were just conducted between two satellites and they were able to transfer hundreds of gigabytes of data. Now, hundreds of gigabytes of data doesn't give us any information about how fast that data was transferred, just about the volume. And that is one of the key challenges with these laser links. One is how fast they can actually send the data. And probably more importantly, or the bigger challenge, is how quickly these links can be established between satellites as they're moving in different directions in orbit. If you think about it, this is a very small satellite. You see them in the launch, they're not that big. And being able to shoot a laser and hit a small target on that satellite across hundreds of kilometers is pretty challenging. So establishing and maintaining these links as the satellites are moving in potentially different orbits is pretty challenging. I've got a video here. This is from Mark Handley, who's been doing a lot of analysis of how these laser links can be used. Uh, you can see the rendering of how the signal might travel along the laser links. And you can see that as the satellites are moving, these laser links need to be reestablished, switched constantly to maintain the path through the satellite constellation. So it'll be interesting to see how these tests progress and how they really progress at, at establishing and maintaining these links. We also don't know much about what two satellites were actually involved. If you remember way back at the very start of the Starlink constellation, they launched two test satellites, Tintin A and Tintin B. So I thought maybe it could be one of those, but I did a little bit of looking and I forgot that actually back in August, early August, one of the Tintin satellites actually was deorbited and burned up in a fireball. So presumably it's not one of those initial test satellites. So it seems like on some of the satellites that they've been launching, SpaceX has been including the hardware for these laser links and just not activating them except for these test scenarios. So it's an interesting dynamic that potentially all the Starlink satellites have the hardware for the laser links and they're just working on the software of tuning and aiming and tracking. It was an interesting choice of words during the webcast. Uh, Kate Ty said, they're continuing to roll out additional features to unlock new capability of the system. It almost sounds like 
over the air updates to activate new hardware. So potentially they've been launching this hardware for quite a while. So again, interesting to see how this develops. A short update on the channel. I've got another video coming out very soon. A lot of people have been asking where and how do I deploy the Starlink terminal? So I've dedicated a whole video to understanding where the terminal can be, how much clearance you need around trees, what angle it's likely to be pointing at, and other concerns around the installation, running the ethernet cable, uh, grounding, earthing, all of those topics. So I've put together a dedicated video coming out soon. I've also made more progress and got some more equipment on my own project to receive uh, Starlink satellites using my own hardware. So again, subscribe if you wanna get all these latest updates. Hit the bell icon so you get notified and you don't miss anything. Thank you very much for watching everyone. See you next time.